This is Smart Women, Smart Power, a podcast that features conversations with some of the world's most powerful women. To encourage women to study STEM or my advice for women studying STEM would be don't be afraid to pick the things that you think you're bad at. Don't think that there's some natural disposition that all of us have who are studying STEM. We feature thought leaders at all career levels, where we explore, among other things, the many contributions that women make to the fields of international business, national security, foreign policy, and international development. Does having women in positions of power influence the outcomes of decisions in these fields? Why or why not? Join me, Dr. Kathleen McInnes, Director of the Smart Women Smart Power Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, for these incredible conversations. I am delighted to welcome Molly Breen to the Smart Women Smart Power podcast today. Molly is, in short, incredible. She is the chief executive officer of Perigee, a company designed to help businesses of all sizes build a holistic cybersecurity platform that implements security with a consumer-grade user experience. Prior to her role today, she created and led teams to strengthen critical infrastructure at the National Security Agency, and she was the technical lead on the artificial intelligence and machine learning team at the Pentagon, where she helped modernize military strategy and deployment on those matters. So welcome, Molly. Those are huge roles, huge portfolios. Wow. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. So you're basically sitting at the cutting edge of making cybersecurity easy and accessible for like normal people (laughs) and normal businesses. How did you find yourself working in the national security sector? That's where you started from and then built out Perigee. How did you get into this weird world of national security and, and cybersecurity? I, since I was a little kid, ever since I can remember, always wanted to be a spy. I was obsessed with spy movies. I watched Miss Congeniality with Sandra Bullock, which if you're not familiar with the movie is about an FBI agent who goes undercover in a beauty pageant. And I don't think we give this movie enough credit for how it really pushes the boundaries and encourages women to look at how we can essentially start pushing the boundaries around what it means to be extremely good at your job and talented and hardworking and fierce at the same time as being in this very contrasting setting that celebrates beauty and politeness and all of that good stuff. I absolutely love that movie. Spy Kids also came out when I was a kid and all of the gadgets and the technology. And so to me, it was just a question of how am I going to get there? And so I tried a lot of different things when I was in high school. I really thought that the path, my impression of how you got into being a spy was by way of the CIA. That was the only agency I had heard of at that time. And typically I associate the CIA with languages and more of the humanity side of the house. So of course I went to a humanity summer camp hated it. I found I was really bad at writing. I found out I was really bad at languages. As a tangent, I have an identical twin sister and we actually would switch places in high school where she would go to the Spanish class for me and speak (laughs) so that I didn't, I was so bad at languages. So I had to X that path and I stumbled upon, I found that I was always really loving math, like always came back to the fact that I really enjoyed that subject. And at one point, my dad said to me, well, have you heard of this agency called the NSA? I was like, no, I've never heard of it. He's like, That's actually a more secret place than the CIA. I was like, there's a place more secret than the <laughs> CIA, but well, that's where I'm going to go. So by the time I was going into undergrad, I knew that NSA was where I wanted to go, oriented myself around what classes to take. I studied math. I studied computer science. I did my internship at NSA. I graduated and started full-time at NSA. So that was my path to pursuing national security, the It started from this kernel of wanting to be a spy and work on some really secret operations. Mm -hmm. And then how did you go from there to being the technical lead on this huge portfolio, artificial intelligence and machine learning? I mean, that's a subject that's dominating so much of the discourse. I found when I was at the NSA, my favorite projects, the ones that I was drawn to the most was where you got to bring something new to a team that maybe hadn't seen it before. So my very first office that I can't really talk about, I was the first mathematician to have ever been in that office. And before they were approaching problems 
purely from a software engineering perspective, but they had never had somebody who'd come in and done and had done algorithms before and could improve some of the things within their within this office from this more algorithmic lens. That was my very first office. And I took that kernel and thought about how do I how do I go to every office thereafter? And whether it's a math background or some other expertise, what's the thing that I'm bringing unique to it? So as you fast forward and I ended up co-leading the AI ML portfolio at the Pentagon, it was through this path of recognizing that NSA is, is wonderful, but we're not always doing that much to what well, we've done a lot better recently. But at the time, bringing what we knew and how we saw the world into more private sector settings. And I, I stumbled upon this office called the Defense Innovation Unit, which essentially was bringing startup, the startup ecosystem system into the DOD. I found some loopholes in, in just government red tape bureaucracy where there was no MOU between NSA and, and DIU, which essentially means there was no way to transfer my NSA billet into the DIU, but you can take a very long work trip through the DIU. So I took a very long work trip, quotes around work trip, to the DIU, where um, essentially just put in that I was traveling for a while, even though I wasn't traveling, I was going 20 minutes at the Pentagon, and was able to be the first MSA mathematician at the DIU, helping to lead this AI ML portfolio, which of course, there's a lot of math involved, and helping to usher in the startup technology and have that modernize the military strategy and the efforts that we are working on. Technological progress in artificial intelligence and machine learning within the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. I'd be very curious, I mean, because of your central role in that world, how do you assess how the Pentagon is prioritizing and keeping up with the, the advancements in AI and machine learning today? I mean, there's so much going on, like you read about it every day, chat GPT, all the things, right? Yeah, I guess if you were going to give the Pentagon a report card, where would you mm -hmm. put them? My immediate reaction is before you can even think about solving a problem, somebody has to be aware that a problem even exists. And where I give the Pentagon a lot of credit is, you know, this was a couple years ago. This was before the chat GPT and AI was really in the news. They were thinking about a strategy around AI back then, even just by the pure existence of the portfolio that I was in. But there were so many other initiatives that are happening. One of the initiatives that comes to mind is the Joint AI Center that got started around 2017, 2018, that really speaks to now what we're seeing in the news and just how much attention we're giving it. So I think that they will give them a lot of credit for being on top of it. Granted, could we have started sooner? Maybe, but nobody else was starting sooner. And I do see them as being one of the first movers into paying attention to the AI. And now what I'm really encouraged and excited to see is just how much, how many ways the government has grown in the ability to collaborate with the private sector. I sit now a little bit more closely on the cyber side than just on the pure AI side, but I'm really encouraged by all the ways that organizations like the NSA is getting their face out there and and facilitating discussions around the advancement of cybersecurity and the advancement of AI and cybersecurity. So it's only just the beginning, though, and there is so much work to do that the jury is still out. But I would give them a, a high grade for at least being aware of the problem sooner than it seemed like the rest of the population was thinking about it. Sure. I think that is a nice segue into the decision that um, we're going to talk about with you today, which occurred in the early days when you co-founded your company, Perigee. The dilemma you faced incorporating your technical expertise into your leadership style. What was the dilemma? What was the moment where those tensions sort of really were pulling at it both ends? I'm trying not to mix metaphors. I was like, tensions colliding. No, that's not right. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I'll start with the moment and then can kind of work backwards from what led up to that moment. So the moment is about, I founded the company in, in 2019, but in 2020 is when I had graduated from business school, we were off to the races, and two months or so from that May timeframe, I found out that we were selected for one of the biggest competitions within the startup ecosystem called TechCrunch Disrupt. 
if you've never heard of TechCrunch Disrupt, you've probably seen the memes or seen the, the clips from shows like Silicon Valley. It's these, think of it as this huge stage where the founder is six minutes to pitch. It's really intense. People are cutting them off and the winner at the end gets confetti. That's sort of that moment. And this is the li- that happens in TV. This is the live version of that competition. So one of the biggest startups in tech, and we got selected, which is so exciting, I mean, a few months in. At the time, I was just one person up until that moment. And when that moment hit, I was like, oh, I got to find some people to help us build the demo. We didn't even have a demo necessarily for, we didn't even have a demo prepared to demo on that stage. So I pulled together a team from my network, from my undergrad. We were sprinting towards this deadline of having this demo ready for this big competition. That's where this tension, this feeling of how do I balance my role as a CEO and leaving some of the tech stuff to the tech experts, the engineers, with the background as an engineer and as a mathematician and as somebody who studied computer science and the opinions you might bring to the table. Letting your team do the work, (laughs) taking yourself out of the hands-on stuff and doing the management side. That's an incredibly difficult transition to make, especially if you're building a demo for one of the most important demonstrations. Yeah, I can see that would be a thing. Okay. Exactly. And there's two things that are coming together. One is the managerial aspect. To what extent do you get really fine grained about the technical decisions? To what extent do you try to think higher level? And then there's the identity aspect, which I was alluding to where, you know, my entire life I've been working towards being a hacker. And my entire life I have found ways to sit on both sides of a technical problem from the engineering aspect, but also being able to speak to a lot of different stakeholders. And that even showed up. I mentioned I had just graduated. I was very thoughtful that when I went to business school, I was also getting a master's in engineering so that I was always fulfilling this dual side of the coin. And with this first big hurdle and milestone of the company, I was coming in with this bias of how much of these dual hats that I've always worn, how much can they come together in this decision? And take you through a little bit of of that journey. I remember early on, you know, we were meeting every day, twice a day, checking in in the morning, checking at the end because we didn't have a lot of time and there was a lot of work to get done. And I noticed that early on, I'd ask a lot of questions like, what code base are you using? What packages did you install today? What bugs did you run into? And had to, over time, teach myself or understand that that actually wasn't that productive to the engineer and also realize that it probably also wasn't productive for my role either. It's not going to help me pitch better if and ultimately be able to tell a story about the company that if instead I reframe those questions around what can we do today that we couldn't do yesterday? Or what are the risks to this type of approach coming up in the, in the next couple of weeks that we may have to run into? Or for the company more long-term, just after this competition lasts and having to start to think through those types of questions as a CEO versus the more technical mentor that I otherwise had to do. Were you scared or worried that you wouldn't be able to meet the goal at any point? Or were you just, or were you just like, we're just doing it? Like building a demo for a new company in such a short time frame, it's so early in the new company. I can imagine that'd be very intimidating. And if so, like, how did you deal with that? I was incredibly worried. And just to paint the picture. So yes, I was worried about the demo getting done. And two, I had never done a demo before. Like the word demo, we're throwing it around. But you have to remember, I'd, I'd never built a company before. I'd never essentially built a product from scratch before. And I'd, I'd never demoed anything. Every Anything that I'd ever built was an algorithm that sat behind something. So maybe it spit out a certain output, but it never performed in the way a product has to perform. And one of the things that we did to help de-risk some of this or mitigate the risks around what's going to happen if we don't get a demo done by the time that it needs to get done is building it very iteratively where we started with what's the output that we want? What's the What's going to be the aha moment on the stage where we feel like we'll be able to impress the judges. And what's the least amount of work we have to do to get that output? Okay, great. Now, how do we build on the story from there? So just to get really specific, we were showing off how the Perigee platform could help stop a DDoS attack on an IoT fan. And quick background, a DDoS attack... 
Exactly. So DDoS is distributed denial of service attack, meaning it's when a lot of internet traffic hits one thing all at the same time and causes it to go down. That's all. It's, it'd be like if all of the internet all of a sudden hit our computers and this Zoom call would never, or this, this podcast recording would not be able to function. The second one is IoT, Internet of Things. That's everything that's getting connected in the world, like the toasters and the fridges, the fans, the light bulbs. It's happening a lot in enterprises as well through TVs and security cameras. And so we wanted just to show how there's an example of an attack vector, an attack that will happen on an IoT device that Perigee can block. And so we started by just showing, proving out what do we have to do to launch an attack on this fan and stop it? And maybe that's something as small as just unplugging the device, like just unplug it to show that we stopped it. That's obviously not what we want to demo because it has nothing to do with Perigee, but just understanding what the boundaries are and what we can control. And then we started to layer in more things, more software to eventually get to a place where we could run the Perigee product, the DDoS attack and show that these things were all happening and, and we were doing what we needed to do. So that is how we were able to eventually get to a place of getting this demo done in maybe two and a half weeks. It was quite, Holy it was quite a stressful exper- experience. Yeah. Two and a half weeks? Yes. Wow. Okay. So reflecting back on important leadership challenges and defining what your leadership style is within Perigee and with all of these different backgrounds and inputs, do you feel that being a woman has impacted how you made these decisions? If so, why? If not, why not? I'll start with the answer, yes. And then we can break it down into different percentages of useful. But yes, in part because I think that the challenges that I faced are natural for anybody coming out of a tech program, coming into a CEO leadership position, managerial position, doesn't necessarily have to be at a startup, in any different situation. I may have held on to it a little bit longer in part because of not only not wanting to give into stereotypes that women are not technical. And there was, I think that it's possible I wanted to hold on to it a little bit longer because no longer doing the tech feels like one less woman out there doing something very technical. And we want to see more women do more technical things and encourage a lot of women to pursue STEM. So I held on to it for a little bit longer. Where I feel today, though, is in having a lot of excitement for reshaping the narrative of what it means to be a woman in STEM and all the ways that that can be demonstrated and illustrated. And it doesn't just mean hands on keyboard and it doesn't just mean talking about lines of code every single day, but it can mean interacting with people who are technical. It can mean selling things that are technical. It can mean, and it can mean managing people who are technical. There's a whole host of areas I've had to go through the journey of not just understanding the role, but also understanding what is my relationship to being technical and that it can mean different things at different points in my life. On that note, what advice would you have for young women and and girls looking at a career in STEM? Do you have any advice for them looking for to pursue a career in technology? And also, by the way, like, have you seen improvements in Mm. that space? I'll answer the first question first around advice, and then we can pontificate on whether it's improved. On the advice part, one thing we didn't get into is when I originally was starting to study math, a lot of people have said to me along the way, oh, I'm, I wish I could have studied math. I was always really bad at it. And my response to them was, I was never good at math. I just liked math. And I was really comfortable doing something that I was bad at in order to get better at it. And that has always been my philosophy on, I, I've taken that philosophy and I grew a lot and I've thought about that philosophy in a lot of different areas, including now as a founder and thinking about what are the areas of weakness that I am worst at and not being scared to get better at them and to put in a lot of the hard work. I got a, I got a lot of C's, some D's, some F's in, on my math classes and always came out on the other side. To encourage women to study STEM or my advice for women studying STEM would be Don't be afraid to pick the things that you think you're bad at. Don't think that there's some natural disposition that all of us have who are studying STEM. A lot of us have gotten a lot of bad grades in school. We felt completely out of our element, but it's so rewarding to be on the other side and and be able to continue to do what it is that you love. So that would be my piece of advice. That's that's, that's, that's terrific advice, right? Because it's so hard to take on and just keep pursuing something that you're not great at but it with anything it takes time and work to build the craft to build the skills like it's just 
there's no substitute for the hard work. Yeah. Maybe this is controversial, but I still think that studying math and computer science at the same time in undergrad is the hardest thing I've ever done, even harder than starting a company. It stretched my brain so much. There was so much loneliness and doubt and struggle all involved. And it made me so much of a better person, both in terms of what opportunities were available, but just in terms of resiliency. And I was thinking about that experience, just even with the financial crisis that we had a few days ago, that if I could get through math and computer science in undergrad, I can get through anything. We can figure it out. And the financial crisis being the Silicon Valley Bank. Exactly. Exactly. The Silicon Valley Bank. Exactly. Where do you think we are in terms of (laughs) women's STEM? I'm really excited to see movement. It seems like there's a lot of attention being brought to the cause. There's still so much work to do in so many ways. I think that one area, I could list them all off, but one area just in terms of the startup ecosystem, the latest research that I've seen is just dates back to 2021 where just 2% of venture capital went to female founded teams, which is a minuscule amount of capital going to women. That's one example. Some of the areas, you know, we recently had International Women's Day. It seemed like there was a lot of talk on LinkedIn about celebrating women. What I'd really like to see is more people just sticking their neck out, making introductions, closing the deal, hiring the candidate that maybe otherwise wouldn't have gotten hired. Like there's so many actions that need to be put in place. Yeah, moving beyond the lip service. Exactly, exactly. There's a lot of work and I'm excited by the amount of attention. That's again, going back to the original, when we talked about AI at the very beginning of this conversation, the government was aware they were starting to turn the gears. That's solution number one. I'd say we're still in phase one where there's a lot of attention being put to it, but we're nowhere near where we need to be. And there needs to be a lot more action. Thank you, Molly, so much for your time today and for sharing your lessons learned on being a CEO, business leader, the challenges of startups, the challenges of transitioning to management roles the position of women in STEM, your own experiences with that. Thank you so much for this very rich conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Subscribe to the Smart Women Smart Power podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to great content. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Smart Women, or you can follow me on Twitter at KJ McInnes One. Thanks for listening and join us next time.